Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Wednesday afternoon lecture. And this particular lecture is a very special one, because this is the annual Marshall Nirenberg Lecture, which we hold each year uh, to honor the Nobel laureate and a long time a remarkable scientific leader of the NIH Intramural Program, uh, Marshall Nirenberg who roughly 50 years ago, depending on how you count uh, the uh, acquisition of information about the genetic code, figured that out uh, here at NIH, uh, many considering that to be maybe the second greatest event that's happened in molecular biology. You always got to have a little doff to Watson and Crick, but right after that, uh, we would go to Nirenberg, the person who sorted out uh, how you do that thing called translation and how that code gets changed from nucleic acid uh, to amino acids. And we've had quite a year of celebrating Marshall because of the fact it is uh, the 50th anniversary. So already there was an event, which I think many of you attended, uh, the National Library of Medicine put on, which included a presentation by his biographer, included a ceremony uh, where uh, his a widow, Myrna Weissman, uh, donated uh, his Nobel Prize medal uh, to the National Library of Medicine for safekeeping. Any of you who have not wandered over uh, and seen the uh, display of particular aspects of Marshall's research over near Lipset, uh, please do so at some point. It's really very nicely done, uh, including some pages from the lab notebook uh, when this remarkable set of insights were happening, uh, figuring out how those triplets in RNA got converted into specific amino acids. So we honor Marshall again today as somebody who started out, uh, obviously, uh, from a perspective that led us to the genetic code and then went on uh, to become a distinguished neurobiologist uh, and uh, accomplished many other things. And for those of us fortunate enough to know him uh, while he was active in the sciences uh, here at NIH, uh, one of the nicest human beings that you would ever hope to meet. Well, we're honored today that our Nirenberg lecturer uh, is David Page. And I should say this is the second in this triplet of Nirenberg events. The third, just to give you a little preview of that, is September 30th. We will, by the fact that we can figure out how to do two Nirenberg lectures in one year, because the academic year is a little different than the calendar year, on September 30th, we will have Tim Lay uh, from Washington University in St. Louis, uh, who is responsible, along with colleagues there, uh, particularly Wick Wilson, for the first sequencing of a cancer cell, uh, namely the yeah, acute myeloid leukemia uh, effort that was carried out several years ago and which, of course, now has expanded into remarkable insights into cancer with the Cancer Genome Atlas and other efforts. So mark your calendars uh, for Tim Lay Nirenberg lecture number two of the year, September 30th. But you're here uh, for this particular Nirenberg event and glad that you are and also glad that all those people who are watching on the web have joined us even as you're maybe in the middle of an experiment or working on a manuscript, because I think you're going to have a very interesting time listening to our presenter, uh, Dr. David Page. Uh, he has a very interesting and distinguished uh, career, having gotten his undergraduate degree from Swarthmore in chemistry. He went on to Harvard Med, but also got very interested in research, and although got an MD, and as far as I can tell, not an official PhD, did enough stuff during his medical career uh, that you might have thought that. And so reading a little bit about this, it seems that in 1979, it was the summertime, and he decided he was going to work with David Botstein and Ray White on the idea of making a linkage map of the human genome, which at that point hadn't yet been published. This was, of course, a development that revolutionized our ability to be able to map human disease genes and understand the structure of the genome. And here is this medical student wandering into the middle of this. And so he was one of the first students to do this, and his job was to identify bits of DNA that were variable between individuals, restriction fragment length polymorphisms, we called them in those days. And those of you who've never done a southern blot, you should be glad you've never done a southern blot, because that's what we had to go on. And it seems one of the first probes that David picked came from what ultimately would prove uh, to be a site of homology between the X and the Y chromosomes. Had he picked other probes, history might have been totally different. At any rate, apparently this caused him to get interested in that and in a meeting with Albert de la Chapelle, uh, standing in front of a poster, uh, the idea of beginning to make sense out of the human Y chromosome 
uh, apparently emerged uh, in David's mind and has been a passion ever since that time. Uh, he, more than anyone else, uh, has been working faithfully over these years under, to understand the molecular basis of uh, what causes a male to be a male uh, in the mammalian uh, set of organisms, including ourselves, and as he will tell you about today, uh, going ever deeper into that molecular understanding in ways that are really quite exciting. He is, at the present time, a fellow and the director of the Whitehead Institute uh, in Cambridge. He's been that director now for almost uh, 10 years. Uh, he's also a professor at MIT and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, also of the Institute of Medicine, also the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a previous awardee of a MacArthur uh, Genius Prize Fellowship. And he's been a faithful person in terms of his service to NIH, uh, serving right now both on the Advisory Council for NHGRI uh, and also uh, serving as an advisor to our Office of Research on Women's Health. And if that wasn't enough, he's been on Colbert. And if you want to really see what happens when you put David in front of somebody who's determined to take apart his uh, models of X and Y chromosomes, uh, go and click on it. It's still up there. And as you might guess, it's actually quite hilarious. So without taking any more of his time, well, let me ask you all to please give a warm welcome to our Nuremberg lecturer, Dr. David Page. Well, Francis, thank you for that warm introduction. And um, um, it's a great honor to um, deliver this lecture in Marshall Nuremberg's uh, name. And I think I would be absolutely uh, remiss uh, in not, uh, I must mention that actually this campus played an enormous role in my scientific beginnings, Francis just referred to a very important summer for me, which was the summer of 1979, when I started working with David Botstein and Ray White on the origins of what would become the Human Genome Project. I must now refer to the two preceding summers, which I spent here on this campus, um, <clears throat> working in the laboratory in the base where I understand there are now many zebrafish tanks. Where is that? In the basement of building six. I, was, I worked for the better part of a year while I was an undergrad. Uh, it's a long story how I could be an undergrad at Swarthmore College and work for the better part of a year in Bob Simpson's uh, lab. But he was an incredibly generous mentor to me. Um, he died in untimely fashion in 2004. He spent the last uh, 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 years of his career at Penn State, but a long time here at NIH. Actually, one of the arrivals, he arrived here in 1969 to an environment that I think had been probably very considerably shaped by Marshall Nuremberg and, and his students. Um, and so I see a strong connection there. But I have to make, I have to make a couple of points about Bob. Uh, there was a second basement that loomed large in my training with Bob. Not only did I work with Bob in the basement of Building 6, but unable to find a, another place to live, I actually lived in the basement of Bob's house on, on Ellesmere Avenue, not too many blocks from here, for the better part of a year. Uh, and this was really my first deep um, uh, research experience, and I'd have to say that Bob was such an incredibly generous mentor to me. It's illustrated on my first scientific publication ever, uh, <clears throat> on which I don't know if you can see it, but I am actually the senior author of this publication. Uh, Arnie Stein was the postdoc, I was the undergrad, and uh, Bob's rule was that he would not list his name on a paper unless he had himself done an experiment. A quite remarkable example. And so I would like to dedicate this, 
this uh, lecture to uh, my memories fond of, of Bob, who among many other things taught me to sail on the Chesapeake, and uh, I learned a few recipes as well, so to Bob. Uh, and I'd also like to uh, have a, th uh, a shout out here to, my lecture is in some sense uh, provoked and inspired by an editorial that, um, <clears throat> that Francis and Janine Clayton published in Nature uh, one year and six days ago. Um, a policy editorial, NIH to, ba to Balance Sex in Cell and Animal Studies. And in this editorial, uh, it's mentioned that in 1993, the NIH Revitalization Act required the inclusion of women in NIH-funded clinical research and noted that by today, that is by 2014, just over half of NIH-funded clinical research participants are women, uh, and goes on to uh, lay out uh, the beginnings of a plan yet to be fully realized uh, by which the NIH plans to address the issue of sex and gender inclusion across biomedical research multidimensionally. And I actually took um, great, uh, great encouragement from the publication of this editorial, and it in some sense inspires the lecture that I'd like to deliver to you today. And why does it matter so much to think about uh, the existence of males and females in this way? Well. The phenomenology out there in the world of medicine and disease couldn't be stronger. So let's take, for example, the case of, oh, oh let me see. I must uh, give, uh, oh, no, let me see, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Maybe I, oh, okay. I rearranged a few things. Um, I will make the case that uh, we have enormous differences in the severity and incidence of disease across virtually all disease categories. So let's consider, for example, the case of rheumatoid arthritis, where for every affected man, there are two or three women affected with rheumatoid arthritis. Or if we flip it around and take autism spectrum disorders, for every, every girl diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder, about five or six boys diagnosed. Flip it around again, think about lupus. For every man who is suffering from this very debilitating disease, about five or six women suffer. And if you say, is there any obvious explanation in the anatomy of males and females as to why these differences should occur? The answer is no, it is by no means obvious. And I would suggest that if you look across the sweep of medicine, Sex differences in incidence and severity are not the exception. They are, in fact, the rule. It's just, you just have to look closely enough. And so it is in the context of understanding these sex differences that extend across the body and way beyond the reproductive tract that I'd like to focus my comments today. And so uh, <clears throat> let me then return to my title slide and invite uh, Perhaps I, I invite uh, uh, Bob Simpson and Marshall Nirenberg to join in and listen with us as we uh, think about the prospect. I'm going to suggest that males and females read their genomes differently. And I'm going to suggest that if we are to understand this, we're going to have to look not just to our, <coughs> not just to our uh, chromosomes, and I, I put up here on the, um, I put up here on the left my favorite pair of chromosomes. Uh, <clears throat> on, the, on the left of the left, standing upright, stately, statuesque, the very robust X chromosome, and to its immediate right with its head down, the demure and diminutive Y chromosome. Truth be known, I've spent the better part of my career defending the honor of the Y chromosome in the face of some insults to its character and future prospects. But we will put all of that in some context today. But I also want, will we'll bring into, uh, try to bring into this narrative the, uh, <clears throat> the turtle, which as illustrated here exists as male and female. 
Um, and I'd like to suggest that as we think about sex differences in the reproductive tract and far beyond, nothing in biology, as Dobzhansky said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Okay, so, so how then, how then did, uh, 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 <coughs> did sexual reproduction evolve? Well, um, There we go. Oh, sorry, I'm replaying this again. There we go. Okay, I'm going to suggest that in the evolution of sexual reproduction, there were four great inventions. Uh, now, I, I, I wanted to do this in a somewhat interactive way, so um, <clears throat> maybe I'll, uh, yeah, I'm going to ask a few questions. I hope you'll, you'll play along with me. So, how old is sex? What was that? Two billion. Two billion years old. Excellent answer. Excellent answer. So, I'm going to see. I'm going to suggest that. Uh, well, maybe we have easier questions. Um, how old is the universe? Thirteen, fourteen billion years old, and the planet is four and a half. Okay, so we had a suggestion that the planet is four and a half billion years old. Sex is maybe two billion years old. So let, let's, let's go with this. Uh, I'm going to suggest the first great ev invention in the evolution of sexual reproduction was the ability to exchange hereditary information in a, in an or in a somewhat organized way. And I will credit prokaryotes with, with inventing this on the order of three to four billion years ago. But let me suggest that in the, um, uh, that in the evolution of, of, of sex, uh, well, that this, that this manner of exchanging hereditary information uh, was a little bit free form and fairly uninhibited. All of that changed with the advent of eukaryotes who put genes in pairs. Now, why do we put genes in, why did eukaryotes put genes in pairs? Well, obviously, so that we could teach Mendelian genetics. If we didn't have genes in pairs, this would be very, very difficult. No, genes are in pairs, so we can take those pairs apart at meiosis and put them back together again at fertilization. It's a very elaborate way of recombining our, our, our genetic information. And this is, in a sense, the defining feature of sexual reproduction is practiced in eukaryotes. And so this means an alternation of diploid and haploid phases in a life cycle. I put up here yeast as a... Um, sort of poster species for taking sex to this level. And I will suggest that our, our, uh, the person who answered, who shouted out from the back of the auditorium was right on the mark. This is, uh, it looks like meiosis evolved once in the basal eukaryotes on the order of one and a half to two billion years ago. In fact, it is the rule, not the exception, that, that across eukaryotes, meiosis and, and sexual reproduction in this manner are practiced. So, but in yeast, there are two kinds of gametes produced, two kinds of spores. They're called A and alpha. They're indistinguishable structurally. So the next invention is actually to uh, make the gametes, the products of meiosis, dimorphic. And <clears throat> if one of them is big, we call that product the egg. If one is small, we call that the sperm. In fact, whoever makes the big gamete is the female. Whoever makes the little gamete is the male. This is the most broadly applicable definition of male and female across the animal kingdom. Do you make the big gamete or the little one? And I will offer up as a poster species for taking sex to this level, I will offer up the, uh, uh, oh, I'll say that this evolved uh, in the animal kingdom many t uh, several times, and in our lineage on the order of 600 to 700 million years ago. <clears throat> um, and I will offer up as a poster species for taking sexual reproduction to this level, I will offer up the turtle. Now, why the turtle? Well, here again we have a mating pair, and what I show here is a line diagram of the innards 
of a male turtle and the innards of a female turtle. You don't have to take in all the details. I'm only making the point that the internal anatomy of a male turtle and a female turtle are every bit as different as are the internal anatomies of a male and a female mammal. <clears throat> but the remarkable thing about turtles is, though they have males who make sperm, females who make eggs, both reproduce, both make gametes by meiosis, there are no sex chromosomes in turtles. Instead, uh, the male and female are genetically identical. The existence of two sexes is purely epigenetic. So in turtles, it's actually the temperature at which the egg incubates that determines whether the animal develops as an anatomic male or as an anatomic female. And so I will suggest that the turtle teaches us unambiguously that the same genome can be read in two different ways, exactly the same genome. There is a male in turtles, there is a male reading and a female reading of the same genome, yielding vastly different anatomies. So <clears throat> that's where we are with turtles. So turtles have gone through the first three inventions here. They make dimorphic gametes, but they have not gone on to the fourth invention, which gets piled on top, and that is sex chromosomes. So sex chromosomes <clears throat> can exist as in us, XXXY. Um, that is the convention that we, that we use when it's the male that has two different sex chromosomes. It's in us or in Drosophila, for example, or they can be ZZZW. Uh, That's the case where it's the female that has two different sex chromosomes, as in birds, or butterflies, for example. And it turns out that sex chromosomes have evolved many, many times. And I will take you through a little detail of how our own mammalian sex chromosomes evolved. But it turns out that sex chromosomes have evolved independently many, many times. Our sex chromosomes in mammals had their origins on the order of 300 million years ago. But the real point I'm making is that the sex chromosomes are, in some sense, a Johnny-come-lately in this world of sexual reproduction. They're a late addition to an already perfectly functioning system of determining sex, of making of males and females. And I point this out, I point out this evolutionary sequence in order to help remind you that we never teach it this way. In all courses in which, I, which I've encountered, of developmental biology or in medical school courses, how do we teach sex differentiation in mammals? We always start with the sex chromosomes and we work backwards from there. But I'm saying this is absolutely not how it occurred across the course of evolutionary time. <clears throat> so, but where did our sex chromosomes come from anyway? Let's again put this in an evolutionary context. So it turns out the last common ancestor of birds and mammals lived about 310 million years ago, uh, <coughs> our amnio ancestor. And of course, in mammals, we ended up with an XXXY sex determining system. In birds, a ZZZW system. And so the W, male specific, uh, chromosome is, in some sense, the reciprocal, uh, the female-specific W chromosome is, in some sense, the reciprocal of the male-specific Y chromosome, and the Z is um, shared between the sexes, as is the X in mammals. So where, how did we end up with these two very different situations from a, st a common starting point? Well, it turns out that the human X and Y evolved from a perfectly ordinary pair of autosomes. And one of the ways we know that is that those autosomes that gave rise to our X and Y still exist as autosomes today in birds. OK, so next time you're visiting a chicken coop, and you have that, that sort of automated DNA sequencer in your pocket, and on the spot you sequence the genome of the first 
bird you encounter and you compare it, you on the spot align it with your own, you will see that chicken chromosomes one and four are dead ringers for your X chromosome. And conversely, where did the chicken uh, Z and W come from? Well, so it turns out the bird Z and W evolved from other autosomes of our common ancestor that live on in us as autosomes. Okay, so we have these beautifully reciprocal experiments of nature. And I like these experiments of nature so well, I, I like to flip back and forth between them. And so I'll do that just briefly here. You see, it's, if you look at things too much, you become, but in any case, beautifully reciprocal experiments of nature. Well, <clears throat> but how did this all play out? Well, what happened along the course of the evolution of the X and the Y? Well, it turns out that genetic decay decimated the human Y chromosome. We now know, we've been able to reconstruct essentially the set of genes that were on those ancestral autosomes that gave rise to the X and the Y. Looks like there are about 649 genes on the ancestral autosomes that gave rise to the human X and Y. Um, <clears throat> of those genes, 638 survive today on the human X chromosome. So the X chromosome did a great job of nurturing and maintaining these ancestral autosomal genes. How did the Y chromosome do? Well, the Y managed to hang on to 17 of those 600. Now, I heard a woman laugh there, <laughs> right. Maybe it was an, even a cackle. Right? So it's, uh, I don't know, there's sexually dimorphic responses to this story, which I've never quite been able to make sense of. Um, so, so stuff survived on the X, a little bit of stuff survived on the Y. So 17 ancestral genes survived on the Y, and not surprisingly, perhaps, all 17 of those also survive on the X chromosome. So what this means is we're, right, we're ending up with 17 XY gene pairs. And let me illustrate for you what this means in more detail. So here is one particular XY gene pair, KDM5C on the X, KDM5D on the Y. Uh, and in this case, the genes are similar, but not identical. They're 85% identical at the, at the DNA level. They encode proteins in this case that are 87% identical at the amino acid level. And re recognize, these were formerly alleles on an ordinary pair of autosomes, existing, persisting as a single copy gene on the X, a single copy gene on the Y, I'm showing you one example of 17. <clears throat> so the X and Y genes are both expressed in human tissues. What this means is that XX female tissues express exclusively the X isoform. XY tissues express both the X and the Y isoforms. And um, I will point out that this XY pair and most all the others have no known role in sex differentiation as classically defined. That is, how do you become an anatomic male or how do you become an anatomic female? <clears throat> so how did this all come to be? How did we lose so many genes from the Y chromosome? And how did we hang on to a, just a few? Well, so let me now recast this story of sex chromosome evolution. So, 300 million years ago, over here on the left, when we were reptiles, and of course, when you get together with family, certain occasions, you talk about the old days, so I just want to help you elaborate upon this. 300 million years ago, when we were ordinary, uh, when we were reptiles, we had this ordinary pair of autosomes. Somewhere on the order of 200, 300 million years ago, a mutation arose to give rise to what would live on today as the sex-determining SRY gene on the Y chromosome. And then what ensued is first in the immediate vicinity of SRY, and then over a larger region, the X and the Y chromosomes stopped trading material. They stopped crossing over, over an increasingly large portion. And what happened then, it turns out that being able to exchange genes at meiosis 
provides an excellent way of, over the course of many generations, purging the system of mildly deleterious mutations that damage, that, that diminish gene function. So the Y chromosome is now following a path by which it, it has lost its purging function, and so it accumulates um, um, decrepit copies of genes, maybe deletes some of them outright, and so we end up with an X chromosome that has retained the gene content of the ancestral autosome, and the, the genes of the Y chromosome have, uh, by and by, many of them fallen away, but we said we've hung on to a small number. And so I liken this voyage of the Y chromosome across these last few hundreds of millions of years, I liken it to the voyage of, of one particular ocean liner. Uh, yeah, now when, when, when most people look at this painting of the sinking Titanic, your eye is drawn perhaps first to the sinking ship, but my eye is drawn to these life rafts down here in the bottom where there are 17 hardy survivors uh, remaining from this voyage of the Y chromosome. And uh, what I'd like to do is, is tell you now about our efforts to reconstruct in greater detail uh, this, this, this voyage and figure out what is it about these genes that led to their survival. And here I want to acknowledge the incredible work of a team of scientists um, at Whitehead led by Winston Balot, joined by colleagues at the Genome Sequencing Centers at Washington University, led by Rick Wilson and Baylor College of Medicine, uh, led by Richard Gibbs. And over the last 12, 15 years, we have been working very hard to reconstruct in great detail this voyage of the, uh, the sex chromosomes by reconstructing sex chromosome evolution through the studies of nine species, and let me share them with you here. <laughs> well, Francis, uh, I thought this would be the appropriate time to acknowledge the source of the Y chromosome that we sequenced. Now, we hadn't, I should have taken up with you the issues of informed consent. <laughs> But maybe after the, after, in the question and answer period, we can work that out. Okay, so uh, in this reconstruction, we have compared Francis's Y with that of the, uh, the chimpanzee, the rhesus monkey, and the marmoset, and thrown in the mouse and the rat. And since some of our collaborators in Texas, we throw in the bull. Uh, and for good measure, as a marsupial outgroup, the South American opossum, uh, and for very, very good measure, we needed an avian outgroup, and so we'll put in uh, the chicken. Now, all of these, I will remind you, are XY. Uh, all these mammals are XY, and of course, the chicken down here is ZW, but there is something wrong with this image, which is it should not be the rooster, so let's correct this. I'm just checking to see if you're paying attention. It should be the hen. We're always teaching. Um, and so what I want to tell you is that we are now mostly done with assembling um, ultra-high-grade reference sequences of the Y chromosomes of these eight mammals. And, what has, and I want to tell you what's emerged from that. From looking at the Y chromosomes of these eight species, we actually find that of, of those 649 genes that were on the ancestral autosomes, 36 of those genes survive today on the Y chromosome of one or more of these eight species. And here is the complete listing of the species and the 36 genes and which genes are home on the Y chromosome in each of those eight species. We had previously, over the, uh, over the previous years, we had identified 18 such XY pairs, previously by comparison of human, chimp, and rhesus. 
adding the additional species adds 18 more, so a total of 36 ancestral surviving genes in one or more of these eight species, and it enables a deep reconstruction of the sex chromosome evolution. Uh, an important point in passing here, as we think about the use of model organisms, as we think about the use of other species for understanding the biology of human sex differences and of understanding the biology of the human sex chromosomes, this chart is extremely relevant. So I pose for you the question, if, I don't know if you can see this, if you can see it well enough, which species has the fewest XY pair genes? It's sort of which of the species has the smallest number of dots in its column? Well, it turns out somewhat sadly, it is the mouse, which has only nine such XY pairs surviving, and specifically, the mouse Y chromosome lacks 10 of the human's seven, of the human Y's 17 ancestral XY pair genes. Um, I will point out that actually the rhesus monkey is a wonderful match. Every gene, every ancestral gene on the human Y is also on the rhesus Y chromosome. Um, <clears throat> just a note in passing. So, now let's think about these, what, what features, if anything, unite these 36 genes that survive on the Y chromosome of one or more of these eight species? And I will pose the question, which was framed in the movie, uh, were the survivors good or were they lucky? Did they have special qualities that favored their survival? And what are the implications for sex differences beyond the reproductive tract? Well, I'll cut to the chase and say, first of all, I'll first give you not a statistical assessment, but an impressionistic assessment. If one looks at these 36 XY gene pairs and the proteins that they encode, some, some things jump out immediately. First of all, most of these XY gene pairs encode regulators broad regulators of gene expression. Chromatin modifiers. I'm, uh, and actually, I again come home. I will remind you that when I was working in the, in the basement of Building 6, I was working with Bob Simpson on chromatin structure. I didn't think I would come back here and be pointing out that the X and the Y chromosomes seem to have something of a specialization, a survival, preferential survival on the Y of genes involved in chromatin modification, transcription, splicing, translation, and protein stability and degradation. This is impressionistic, but let me, let me add some additional features. And for those of you who can see these names up here, I won't be surprised if many of you see some of your favorite players. The genes on the X, remember each of these is an XY pair, there has been considerable cell biological and bio, biochemical effort devoted to the study of the X members of these pairs, relatively little effort devoted to their Y counterparts. Ah, and so in some sense, if I just flip back here, these encode regulators of gene expression, which if I'm a little more playful with it, I might say that most of these XY pair genes encode genome readers. So thinking again about male and female readings of the genome, I'd like to suggest that perhaps part of the explanation for how that plays out in mammals is to be found in these pairs. But let me tell you more about these pairs. The 36 ancestral XY pair genes have special qualities versus the controls. I should say that evolution delivered to us a beautifully prepared set of controls. The controls are the 649 genes minus 36 that went down with the ship. All these genes had, an, had a ticket on the ancestral autosomes. When we do statistical comparisons, when Winston does statistical comparisons, what falls out is that impressionist, well, the, first the impressionistic one, that these are enriched in broad regulatory functions. The 36 surviving ancestral genes are much more broadly expressed across adult tissues 
then are the genes that went down with the ship. Now you could say, well, how do I know about the expression patterns of the genes that went down with the ship? I'm referring to the expression patterns of the X homologs, which can be studied, right? So I'm saying the genes on the X that don't have a surviving counterpart on the Y, those genes tend to be, as a group, more narrowly expressed than those that survived on the Y. The genes that survived on the Y, those XY pairs tend to be more broadly expressed, be expressed in preimplantation embryos as well. And they show much greater likelihood of being haploinsufficient. So we think that these are dosage sensitive genes. And I should say a nice correlate of this is that in, in virtually all cases, the X homologs of these genes escape X inactivation. That is to say, these genes, these XY pair genes, regardless of whether you're talking about a male cell or a female cell, these genes are expressed in two active copies per cell, either both of the X's or the X and the Y. This leads me to um, uh, a, little, a little comment on Turner syndrome. So Turner syndrome is, of course, classically associated with an XO or 45X uh, chromosomal constitution. It's very clear that the short stature observed in girls and women with Turner syndrome is due in part to haploinsufficiency of, um, a, of a pseudoautosomal gene, shocks. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to propose that other somatic features of Turner syndrome are due to haploinsufficiency of other of broadly expressed ancestral XY gene pairs of the sort that I've been describing. Uh, <clears throat> and I'd further like to propose that these features will ultimately be traceable to individual XY gene pairs. <clears throat> further, I want to sort of let you in on the uh, secret that Though you may think of the 45X or XO condition in humans as being viable, it's not. 99% of 45X human fetuses abort spontaneously. How then can one in every couple of thousand girls or women have Turner syndrome? Well, what is suspected, what is strongly suspected is that the surviving girls and women are actually mosaic for another, cell for another cell population that bears a second sex chromosome. And I think the evidence in support of that is rather strong. Well, so if having a single X chromosome is in humans a lethal condition, then why are males alive? Okay, I hear a little hissing, that's, uh, yeah. Um, so I would like to make a proposal then regarding human male 46XY viability. I would like to suggest that, the, that of the 17 surviving genes on the human Y chromosome, surviving from the ancestral autosome, it turns out 12 of those are very broadly expressed and have X homologs that escape X in activation. I would like to, to suggest that those 12 broadly expressed ancestral Y genes are collectively essential for ensuring the viability of human XY, 46XY fetuses. <clears throat> and <clears throat> that uh, these 12 Y-linked genes and their X homologs are collectively haplolethal and that there is no viable human monosomy. So the surviving genes in the Y chromosome have special qualities that favored their survival and that of 46XY fetuses. And the question then is, do these XY gene isoform pairs um, play a broader role in sex differences in health and disease? And I throw this out more or less as a speculative possibility, but one which I find very motivating. So let me summarize what I've said to this point and, and compare old and new understandings of the human Y and X chromosomes. The old understanding was that the Y chromosome carries one sex determining gene. We now understand that the Y, and I haven't taken you through all the details, that carries about 76 protein coding genes, encoding uh, 27 distinct proteins. Our view 
of the Y in the past, and I say still in, in, in virtually all schools, is that the Y chromosome, whether or not you have a Y chromosome, matters only in the gonad. But what I've told you is that there are 12 different Y genes that are expressed very broadly throughout the body. Um, <clears throat> And these wi widely expressed Y genes encode powerfully general regulators. The old view was that in females, the second X is transcriptionally silent. But we actually now know that there are greater than 100 genes on the human X chromosome that are transcribed from the second so-called inactive X chromosome and that these include X-specific versions of the Y's um, uh, broad regulators. <clears throat> and finally, I think the, pre the prevailing view has been that outside the gonads, it doesn't matter whether you're XX or XY. The prevailing view since the 1940s has been that outside the gonad, XX and XY cells are functionally equivalent. What I am instead suggesting is that throughout the body, that there exist fundamental, if subtle, biochemical differences between XX and XY cells as a result of the expression of those 12 XY isoform pairs. So, and this leads me, since I am, um, <clears throat> since we are near the seat of government, this leads me to suggest an analogy. Um, and I'm going to see, I, I fear I may have screwed up my slides here. I'm hopeful that when I press this button, I'm going to see what I'm hoping for. Um, yes, okay. So, in George Washington's cabinet, he had a couple of strong, he had a number of strong personalities. Um, one of them, on, shown on the left, was Alexander Hamilton, and to his right, Thomas Jefferson. Now, you may know that these two individuals had rather different notions of how our young country should be governed. Um, <clears throat> Hamilton, Hamilton's federalism called for a very strong central government. And Jefferson was a champion of uh, states' rights. Now, some have told me that this debate continues to this day. <clears throat> but in any case, and you know, who won the debate? Well, um, it's a tough quest, it's a tough call. I mean, Hamilton got the 10. Uh, Jefferson got the two. Um, well, but what I, the real question that I want to suggest, that I want to indicate is how might Hamilton, the consideration of Hamiltonian federalism and Jeffersonian republicanism, how might this inform our understanding of sex differences beyond the reproductive tract? Well, I would like to suggest <clears throat> that um, uh, I would like to suggest that this is the model. We have been living this model since the 1940s. I will call this the Hamiltonian model of the strong central gonad, which is to say this is the model whereby uh, whether you're XX or XY matters only at the seat of sex differential government, that is, in the gonad. And then all other sexual dimorphism across the body, and I would say all other sexual dimorphism in both health and disease, should first and foremost be considered in the context of sex hormones circulating across the body and radiating, in a sense, out from the gonad. But what I, would, what I would like to suggest is that the existence of the 12 very broadly expressed XY pairs uh, might lead us to think that 
As powerful as this model is, and I think this model will continue to have enormous explanatory power, I would like to suggest that we might add to this some element of, of Jeffersonian republicanism, which I would depict as, as follows. This is sort of the state's rights view of the role of the sex chromosomes uh, uh, throughout the body. Uh, and uh, and I, I think actually that the, uh, the time is rolling on here. I've got um, a few other things that I might have gone into, but I think I, the better part of valor would be to call things to a close at this point and see if you have any questions. I want to thank you so much for your attention. Right. Well, thanks for stopping in this provocative space. And we now have time for questions. Please use the microphones in the aisles because people listening by video will then be able to hear you. And let's start right over here. Yeah, there are situations which there is uh, Y chromosomes in females via uh, incidental chimerism. And this sure. would be perinatally, when you inject it, this has all been documented, there's case reports of that. Uh, when females get uh, transfusions or organ transplants. And lastly, there has been documented a male differentiation in a teratoma in a female, although that might represent a deceased a conjoined twin that died in utero. And some of the older literature indicates that rheumatoid arthritis can, could be related, mm. or lupus could be actually related to these perinatal Y chromosome injections into a female. Do you have an opinion on that? And are these chimerisms significant in the examples that I've given? Well, I think, so you draw, you rightly draw attention to the incredibly important um, uh, phenomenon of XXXY chimerism, which as you say, can arise naturally when, for example, an XX and an XY embryo fuse. So when you essentially fuse with your twin, um, and can also arise as a result of transplantation. And I would, just, I would just point out in passing that actually there can be problems with uh, transplants from other otherwise in, um, otherwise well-matched uh, uh, donor and recipient, there can be rejection of transplants from one sex to the other, even when all of the autosomes are well-matched. Uh, and in fact, the basis of that uh, minor histocompatibility rejection are in fact the widely expressed XY gene pairs that I referred to. So, those widely expressed Y genes provide epitopes that can be recognized by the immune system. So I think the, the possibility that you, that you raise that some autoimmune disorders and their increasing frequency and their higher frequency in females could have its origins in, a sen in, 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 in some sense in chimerism uh, due to pregnancy, I think is an interesting one. I am personally rather agnostic on this proposition at present. I'd be delighted to discuss it further with you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. David, let me ask you, because I'm fascinated by this tale you told us about evolution uh, of sex determination, the two different pathways that happened between birds and, and mammals. It, it seems like, and maybe tell me if this is right, that in order for this to have happened by mutation of what was previously an autosomal gene, yeah. you'd have to start with a very special gene that was involved maybe as a temperature sensitive way that turtles, for instance, uh, determine sex based on the ambient temperature. So it would be rather limited set, uh, maybe even just like one uh, gene that had that property and which could then undergo a mutation that caused it no longer uh, to be sen temperature sensitive, but sort of locked in. So presumably SOX3 turned into SRY with something yeah. like that. Yeah. But yeah. that would almost suggest uh, that if you saw this happening independently, it might start with that very same locus. Now help me understand how yeah. in chickens and mammals, it isn't the same locus. Okay. So, Great question. So, and, and, it, and, and Francis, it really looks to be the case that you can find across the animal kingdom many independent occurrences, okay? Mm. 
And actually, so the interest, and, and you raise the question of, in a sense, what genes might be the usual suspects, yeah. right? And is there a list, a short list of usual suspects? Well, it turns out that um, the gene, uh, the SOX3, SRY pair, um, I, I'm not sure if that has been employed independently in other experiments of nature, mm -hmm. but if we now go to the birds, so it turns out there is a gene, um, DMRT, which is on the chicken, it's on the avian Z chromosome. So it turns out that in birds, it is still not entirely clear whether sex is determined by the number of Z chromosomes or by the presence or absence of the W. We still don't know that for sure. The prevailing view at present is that it's actually the number of Z chromosomes, okay? And it turns out this gene DMRT1 is located on the Z chromosome. It is actually a gene that's been implicated in sex differentiation in mammals, actually in Drosophila, in C. elegans, and that gene has been independently uh, brought into a sex determining scheme in a number of other independent animal lineages. So your suspicion that there should be a short list of usual suspects I think is absolutely on the mark. Um, so it's not any old gene, but I will point out um, SRY, SRY's role in human sex, in mammalian sex determination is an extremely fleeting one. So SRY is expressed, plays a critical role in only one cell lineage, in the supporting cell lineage of the gonad for perhaps a few days. <laughs> never to be heard from again. Um, and so it actually, I think, plays into the notion that I was trying to suggest with the turtle, which is to say these pathways of becoming male and female have, are extraordinarily evolved, are deeply evolved over hundreds of millions of years. And really all you need to bring one chromosomal pair to the fore is to throw a little bit of a monkey wrench into the works. You're not fundamentally changing the underlying mechanism, um, which is a, it's a fundamentally epigenetic mechanism which you can toy with. Yeah. Fascinating talk. Um, in, in your cartoon, you, you had drawn that SR, the evolution of SRY might be the initiating event. Yes. How, how good is the evidence for that? And then. What is the mechanism for the deterioration of the surrounding regions? And then is there a role for expansion of repetitive elements? Okay, great series of questions here. So let me, let me see if I can remember all of them. So the first one is, do we really have clear evidence that SRY's emergence was the initiating event? And I should say here, and, and, uh, and Francis alluded to it, so it turns out SRY has a homolog on the X chromosome, SOX3. So it is a gene that was on that ancestral autosome that got tweaked to become a dominant male determining uh, gene. That, what's, when you're trying to reconstruct things back in evolutionary time, the farther back they are, the harder they are to reconstruct with confidence. And so in fact, the weakest link in all of this story is the one that you identified. It's the hardest thing to identify is the very first thing. So I would say that SRY is the oldest event of which we have a remaining vestige, right? But there could have been other accompanying or even preceding events of which there remains no molecular vestige. Your second question was, how does the decay occur on the Y chromosome? I think that was your question. So, what we're rather confident of, and now we have much, we, now we move on to much firmer ground in terms of the molecular evidence. We think that a series of inversions on the Y chromosome were the, were the path by which crossing over with the X was suppressed. And we actually can see the molecular hallmarks of some of those inversions. It was a series of inversions that step by step led to a suppression of crossing over with the, uh, with the X. Um, your third question was, was about um, 
the role of repeats in all of this. And I, and I will, so we have, over the years, we have found very special types of repeats that have formed on the human Y chromosome. Massive, massive palindromes, for instance. I have not said anything about them today. It turns out that in addition to the genes on the human Y that survive from the ancestral autosome, of which, as I said today, there's 17, in addition, there are a number of genes that were imported into the Y chromosome that were not on that ancestral autosome. Almost all of those imported genes serve the function of spermatogenesis, sperm production. And for reasons we still do not fully understand, virtually all of those imported sperm production genes have eventually taken up resonance on spectacularly symmetric palindromic structures on the Y chromosome. So in, in which case, they actually carry essentially a backup copy on the opposite arm of the palindrome. One yeah. more question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would like to draw your attention towards fish. Fish. Yeah. Fish are very good, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are. So where the sexual dimorphism is after the development, where you, the dimorphism is, is linked to the dominance of the female, determines whether the, that particular individual become female. So how do you differentiate in that place? Like how, how the genetically, how, what, what do you think about it? How? Well, it's a great, so you, you, you um, my entire talk and hours more could be devoted, could have been framed entirely in the world of fish. Fish, of course, are a very old and diverse group. And it turns out if you ask, well, how is sex determined in fish? You actually have to specify the kind of fish. There are fish that have sex chromosomes hardwired. There are fish that have environmentally cued sex determination. There are fish that, as you suggest, have socially cued sex determination. And so I think fish by themselves illustrate amazingly the point that I was suggesting that sex determination is fundamentally epigenetic. And there are, you can add, uh, you, you, you can sort of initiate the process by any number of either environmental or genetically hardwired cues. And fish make that point absolutely beautifully. If I go back to the basement of building six, where there are now all those zebrafish tanks, I will say we know excruciatingly little about how sex determination works in zebrafish, though there are males and females, males making sperm and females making eggs. So we have much, much, much to learn um, about sex determination in fish. Thank you. Yeah. Well, David, it's been a wonderful romp through a lot of uh, ideas, <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate the provocative nature in which uh, you pose these questions. So please, everyone, let's thank our Nirenberg lecturer, David Page, one more time. Thank you. Thank you.